Last week when I was working on my video about the new coronavirus, I was seeing a lot of panic. And then this week, especially at the beginning of the week, I was seeing the opposite. I was seeing people saying that there was no need to be concerned and this was just like the common cold. We need to strike a balance. We should be alert, but not anxious, prepared, not panicked, and calm without being cavalier. If someone is cavalier, that means they're not concerned or paying attention to something that they should be paying attention to. Should we be concerned about COVID-19? Yes, be concerned. Don't be cavalier or crazy with fear. I think the reason so many people are experiencing these extreme reactions is because they don't understand how pandemics work. In this video, I'm going to share five things that everyone should know about pandemics. 1% is a big number for a hospital. Let me explain. Let's say you have a city with 1 million people, and in that city you have several hospitals with enough beds for 10,000 people. If you have a new disease that makes 1% of the people in that city very sick at the same time, then you'll have 10,000 people who need to go to the hospital. But the hospitals are not going to be empty. There will already be people there, whether it's because they are having a baby, having surgery, sick with a different illness, or they got injured in an accident. If 1% of the city gets sick all at the same time, you won't have enough space and you won't have enough doctors or nurses to take care of everyone who's sick. If a new disease is only in one area, we call it an epidemic or an outbreak. And if this city of 1 million people was the only city affected, then the hospitals could divert patients to other cities and other cities could send in doctors and nurses to help. In a pandemic, a new disease has spread around the world and there's the risk of all of the hospitals being overwhelmed. If a hospital gets overwhelmed, it's a crisis and it does not just affect the people who are sick with the new disease, it affects everybody who is sick or injured. If you break your arm during a pandemic, will there be a doctor available to help fix it? Hard to say. How many people a hospital can take care of during a pandemic is going to vary a lot depending on the country and the location but most hospitals cannot handle 1% of their population getting sick all at the same time. When it comes to our healthcare system, 1% is a big number. Our second fact is that exponential growth is powerful. If I told you you could either have a million dollars today or one penny doubled every day for a month, what would you choose? A million dollars today or one penny today, two pennies tomorrow? four pennies the next day, eight pennies the day after that, on and on until you got to the 31st day. Hopefully you picked the penny because if you did, then at the end of one month, you would have $21,474,836.48. That is the power of exponential growth. With exponential growth, each day, your amount increases by the same rate. In the case of our penny, it was doubling every single day. With a pandemic, it's going to start off with exponential growth. But it does not keep spreading until it's infected 100% of the population. There will be a point when new people get sick, but everyone they meet is also sick or has already been infected. So then they don't pass the disease on and the new number of cases starts to decrease. Pandemics always follow this type of curve where you have a dramatic increase in the beginning and then it decreases and levels off. But exactly how steep will the curve be? And how tall will it get? We don't know. And this is one of the big challenges of pandemics. A new disease is uncertain. H.P. Lovecraft once said that the greatest and oldest fear was fear of the unknown. Pandemics force us to face that. Consider influenza. Every year, influenza puts more than 100,000 people in the hospital in the US, and it kills more than 10,000 people. And it's worth asking, why are we so concerned about COVID-19 when influenza has killed so many more people this year? It's because we are used to influenza. Influenza is endemic. It's part of our population. And because it's been around for so long, we know that it follows certain patterns. We can anticipate it and plan for it. With influenza, we know cases will start decreasing soon because the flu is seasonal. Is COVID-19 seasonal? We don't know. We know the death rate for most strains of influenza is about 0.1%. What is the death rate of COVID-19? 
we're still finding out and we've seen numbers as low as 0.6% and as high as 3.4%. We have a vaccine for the flu and decades of data showing that the vaccine saves lives. It decreases cases of the flu. We have antiviral medications that help treat the flu. Do we have vaccines and medications for COVID-19? No. Will we have them next year? Unknown. It's these unknowns that make COVID-19 such a concern. But here is something that we do know. A small decrease in the growth rate makes a huge difference. Let's say you have a new disease, about 21,000 people are sick, and the growth rate is 15%. If the growth rate stays at 15%, then in nine weeks, more than 100 million people will be sick. What if you could drop the growth rate to 5%? If you drop the growth rate to 5%, then you only have 400,000 people sick instead of 100 million. With exponential growth, small changes to the growth rate have a huge impact. If you look at the total number of people who get sick in a pandemic, it will look something like this. You start out with only a few cases, but then thanks to that exponential growth, soon you peak with a lot of people being sick, and then it starts to recover and taper off. If you can decrease the growth rate enough, that same pandemic will look like this. It spreads slower and peaks later and puts much less strain on the healthcare system. Epidemiologists call this flattening the curve, and if you're able to slow the spread of a pandemic enough, it's the difference between having all of your hospitals overwhelmed or not. The difference between hundreds of thousands of people dying or not. And there are specific things we can do to flatten that curve. Social distancing and quarantines save lives. Viruses spread by person-to-person -person contact. Social distancing means that you reduce your contact with other people. To help control a mild outbreak, that could mean no shaking hands, standing three feet apart from other people when in public. To prevent a severe outbreak, it could mean closing schools, banning large social gatherings, or large quarantines. The most important type of quarantine is the self-quarantine, asking people to stay home when they're sick. I won't pretend like these are easy answers, because they're not. If you don't have paid sick leave and you're faced with the choice of going to work sick and maybe infecting other people or losing your job, not being able to afford rent, those are not easy decisions. There's a huge cost involved to canceling schools, canceling conventions, or placing entire neighborhoods or even countries on lockdown. The best approach is going to be different with every pandemic, but it's important to remember that anytime a new disease emerges, our behavior is powerful we can reduce the growth rate, we can flatten the curve. Before we go, I want to say one quick thing about last week's video. In last week's video, I said, this new coronavirus is a bit more dangerous than a common cold. In the context of the extremely high death rates of rabies and Ebola, the two viruses we've just been talking about, a little bit more seems appropriate, but it's misleading because when we're comparing COVID-19 and the common cold, COVID-19 is a lot more dangerous. And I wish I had phrased that differently. The main point of last week's video, that most people who become sick with COVID-19 will recover and be just fine, is a valid point. And it's something that's important to remember so that we don't swing to being crazy with fear in how we react to this pandemic. But I do wish I had phrased that differently and I just wanted to make a quick note about that. Most of my videos are intended for kids. And if I mark a video as being for kids, YouTube automatically disables the comments, so it's not possible for anyone to leave a comment on my last video, but this one I'm marking as being for adults and kids. Parents, if you haven't talked to your kids about the coronavirus, I hope you will. Kids are capable of understanding more than we give them credit for, and not talking about it or avoiding the topic tends to increase their fear. I hope this video has helped you learn more about pandemics, and if you have any feedback or questions, there will be comments, so you can let me know down in the comments. Thanks for watching and I will see you again soon.